So let me welcome to the stage Ant Kennedy. Um, Ant is talking, Ant's talk is called A Journey into Cloud Native Machine Learning. Uh, Ant is CTO at Gapsquare, and previously he's worked at Just Eat Adaga. Got it right this time? Thank you. And Boeing, uh, and focusing on full stack engineering and distributed systems. Um, <laughs> this bit really made me laugh. Um, so we, I, I've mentioned this a few times already. We ask each speaker to fill in a few questions about themselves. <laughs> I spat my tea on my desk when I read this bit. Um, <laughs> he's described himself. He's described his last eight years as being a professional keyboard hound. And, oh, no one else thought that was funny. Shit. Oh, guys, <laughs> come on. Support me here. I thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> what, from me or you? Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, darling. <laughs> um, he also recommended that the book that's had most impact on him recently is a book called Shoe Dog. Has anybody read it? No, okay, well, Ant's recommendation, if you don't like him, <laughs> like it, <laughs> you know who to blame. Um, he says that it is written by a chap called Phil Knight and is about the early days of the company Nike, which most of you all know make trainers. Um, he said the book is has a very balanced view of running the company, and basically the guy that wrote the book was a really shit boss, was very honest about it. So it's a good read if you're interested in that kind of thing. But anyway, should we talk about machine learning? Yeah, cool. Okay, so on back on topic. So in this talk, Ant is going to discuss GapSquare's move into the artificial intelligence and machine learning space and how those techniques have added more value into the data that has been collected in the last two years. Let's have a round of applause for Ant. Cool. So uh, as we mentioned, I'm going to talk to you today about our journey into cloud native machine learning. Hopefully, uh, we'll go through some of the tools, our experiences, and processes we've used to get this done, and how we're actually using this in production. Um, very much our experience. You all may have different experiences, but more than happy to chat about that afterwards. So thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, as mentioned, Ant Kennedy, currently CTO at Gapsware. Traditionally been a full stack engineer, uh, looking at uh, both front end and back end services, as well as moving a little bit into the DevOps space and keeping those things running outside of the full stack engineering. I'd very much say I'm an enthusiastic amateur. I, I'll, I'll give it a lot of heart at everything else, and I may or may not do a good job, but I'll try to do my best. And if you ever see me in or around Bristol, um, you can come and say hi. I'm normally accidentally dressed like this backpack, <laughs> much like I am today. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, just pop and say hi. So um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Gap Square. We're a uh, B2B SaaS startup uh, analyzing a uh, company's payroll and HR data for uh, pay gaps, so are they paying uh, men and women fairly, different ethnicities, genders, disabilities? Um, so the primary use cases we have are UK gender pay gap reporting. It's huge for us at the moment. Uh, every April, influx of people panicking. Uh, I need to get my data ready, I need to report. Um, people also doing ethnicity pay analysis, understanding their rewards and compensation, so it's not necessarily just pay, it might be uh, some of the softer benefits you get at a company, like flexible working. And finally, um, we offer global pay equity analysis. So primary use case, understanding, are you paying people fairly? If you're not pay pe paying people fairly, can we identify where that is? So give you a little flavor of what we do. Should. Now is this going to go? No. Two seconds. So uh, for no one, for people who've never seen our tool before, very basic dashboard. Uh, here we're comparing ethnicity of white versus Asian people by job level. Simple breakdown of uh, the pay gaps uh, within the company. You can explore the pay data there. And we also offer the ability to drill down into the contribution uh, against the pay gap. So here we have uh, positive numbers representing uh, uh, widening of the pay gap between white and Asian people and a negative closing that pay gap. Um, then we also offer tools to drill down into that. So very much before we made, uh, did this push into machine learning, it's a statistics-based tool. So uh, a lot going on, people can get a lot of information, but there's a lot more value that we can add at the end of the day by uh, 
using some of these other techniques. So um, what we'll go through uh, is a little bit of context and background, and then kind of the three broad phases we've broken uh, our push into machine learning down to, the investigation phase, so looking at your data, understanding it, what can you do, training models, serving models, and then throwing it all together. So hopefully everyone have an idea of the journey we've been on and how we're using it now and where we'd like to go in the future. So first thing we should probably cover, what do we mean by cloud native? So we mean loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. So this definition is taken from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So not really sure anyone can argue it, but keep that resilient, manageable, and observable in mind throughout this talk. And hopefully, we're, we're ticking that box everywhere. So a little bit about our tech stack. Uh, currently use Terraform to build up our infrastructure in the various cloud environments. And we're running Kubernetes uh, and Helm to actually um, describe our environments and deploy them. Using Prometheus and Grafana to collect metrics and actually visualize them. And big important piece here, GitLab. So we're using this uh, not only for source control, but to manage our deployments into staging and production and spinning up review, review environments on demand as required. Um, and this gives us a huge amount of flexibility in terms of our, in our entire production deployment is defined in the Git repository. Any changes to that Git, re Git repository will then be deployed. And we've got a nice commit history of all the changes going on. If we need to roll back, it's very simple, reverse last commit, et cetera. Uh, services are written in Golang. Uh, front end is a TypeScript Angular app. Uh, we're using Unleash for uh, experimentation slash feature flags, and MySQL is our current persistent storage. Ingress is using Nginx Search Manager, and we've also got an OAuth proxy for some access to internal data. So, number of problems. We've got, you know, before we started uh, looking into this uh, investigation, we were doing things in a very traditional way whereby if we need to do any consultancy or research on customers' data, we'd download it to your laptop, we'd spin up an environment locally, get the work done, hopefully commit your changes back to any, anything, any code that you've written around that, and then uh, carry on as usual. So that worked great when we were just doing it internally. However, we started a collaboration with Harvard University. Fantastic group of economic economists uh, out there that uh, we're looking at explained versus unexplained pay gaps. So where you've identified a pay gap between uh, in different demographics within a company, say men and women, what proportion of that is explained in terms of can we explain it by your performance reviews, education, tenure, or is there a component that's unexplained? And by unexplained, it's either you haven't supplied the data in order to uh, explain that difference or you're actively discriminating. However, they work in R. R's not in our tech stack. I don't know if anybody else has tried to write services in R or wants to. It's not something I want to touch with a barge pole. Uh, data security. We obviously process payroll and HR data. Um, some might consider this sensitive, others might not, depending on who you ask. If we can try and keep the, the surface area of where that data goes and where it's stored to a minimum, uh, fantastic. Makes our lives easier when someone comes along with a deletion request under GDPR. Finally, uh, limited resources. We're, we're a very small startup, six people uh, full time, and then between two and three uh, contractors on the technical side at any given time. This makes it, you know, we need to be agile, we need to be quick in the things we do. We can't spend our time endlessly hacking away on something until we get it working. Um, and we also need to continue to deliver features to our customers. So over the recent uh, last probably four or five years, been a number of trends uh, within the cloud native machine learning space. And what people often mean by cloud native is, does it run on Kubernetes? Um, big companies have been building their own frameworks. So the likes of uh, Uber and Michelangelo or Airbnb's big head, they're building their own platforms, but they've got huge, huge engineering teams. It's very easy for them to go build, up, build something in-house that's bespoke for them and actually does a job very well for what they need it to do. Um, cloud providers are offer also offering uh, tightly coupled solutions. So your Google Cloud, your Amazons, you can then start using those systems, very low barrier to entry. However, you're then tied into those systems, very difficult to move anywhere else. You're beholden to their uptimes and uh, availability and 
also you need to understand what they're actually doing with your data when you pass it through to them. So we've actually decided, let's have a look at the open source world and see how, see what tools and technologies out there can actually solve a number of these problems for us. So we've broken this down into three stages. Uh, investigation, so looking at your data, understanding it, trying out some techniques, see which might be best, uh, training of models, and then finally the serving of predictions um, within our framework. So a couple of goals uh, for the investigation phase. We want to keep the number of, number of locations restoring customer data to a minimum. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to be have ad hoc DBs spun up everywhere, single nodes within uh, uh, within your cloud infrastructure, people are copying data to, let's, let's not do that. It's gonna make life harder in the long run. And we also wanted to reproduce some environments. So rather than the way we traditionally worked was you'd spin it up locally and maybe something like PyEnv to manage your environment, that still relies a little bit on people checking in their code, checking in their requirements, TXT, and ensuring your environment is uh, always up to date and always running the latest. So. Luckily, uh, there's a solution out there. Um, if you've not heard of it, Jupyter Hub. Um, essentially, you run your Jupyter Notebooks or your Jupyter Lab uh, environments within a Kubernetes cluster. It's very, very easy to install. If you want to do no configuration and you're running Helm, run that command. You have a Jupyter Hub environment. Uh, if you want uh, to customize it, uh, you're freely available to go and uh, add extra annota annotations to the node, the so the pods which are spun up, such as Node Affinity, if you need to run on certain hardware. Um, so if, you've not, if you don't know what a Jupyter Notebook is, it looks like this. Nice way of working uh, on these investigation problems and getting a bit of visualization out of it. So stolen diagram from uh, Jupyter Hub. Um, essentially what happens, you'll visit uh, a proxy provided by Jupyter Hub. You'll log in. Uh, if, you're, if you have an environment, you're going to be passed through to that. If you don't have an environment, um, one will be provision, provisioned for you by Jupyter Hub. Uh, so that includes uh, PVCs, um, your, sorry, your persistent volume claims, and attaching those for your storing data while you're working, um, and then also running your uh, custom uh, Docker images that you need for your experimentation environment. And finally, it also manages the life cycle of these environments. So if you were to be working in the afternoon and then you disappear at the end of the day, uh, this will clean up your environment for you after a configured timeout. So just to make sure you're not um, sat there wasting time on potentially an expensive resource. So uh, the way this is working for us is uh, we have a Kubernetes network that's available. Users come in via the proxy, it's not available uh, to their environment, it's not available, Jupyter Hub uh, will spin one up for you, and then access to our production data is done via read-only replica, so, and VPC peering. So our data is then limited to those two spaces. The only real alternative we could think of when we were looking at this was potentially uh, allowing people to spin up a pod and then execing in uh, to that, and that didn't really feel like a very nice thing to do uh, within our Kubernetes environment. So. Now we've got self-serve environments that people can spin up on demand, and hopefully, so on the right, we've got um, the pods running in our namespace, and this is just me logging in here, but as soon as I've logged in, it starts provisioning the environment for me, sets that all up, ready to go, and you can start cracking on with work straight away. Um, So what does this give us? There's actually a huge number of configurations op configuration options available for Jupyter Hub. Uh, we, can ac we can control access through OAuth, which is great for us. We run on G Suite, and uh, we can then authenticate users, make sure only certain people within certain groups actually have access to these environments. Uh, raw data doesn't leave the cloud if you're running the cloud. Um, so we're keeping it in our Kubernetes cluster or in our database. Data shouldn't really live anywhere else. Uh, there's metrics available via Prometheus on the uh, Jupyter Hub itself, so we can understand how that's behaving. 
there's any adverse effects to the environment. We are, however, still collaborating with FreeGit, so <laughs> users still have to remember to check in their code, update it, et cetera. Um, but we're in a better starting point. There is, on the roadmap, there is currently uh, live collaboration coming, but that's uh, still ongoing. So hopefully within the next few months or so, we start to see that functionality. Right. Um, we, uh, the training phase, so done our investigation. We know, we understand our data. How do we want to train a model for that? And what's the best approach? So again, we want to keep our customer data locations to a minimum. Reuse existing compute and uh, for the sake of time, reuse existing technologies. So we had a look at things like Kubeflow and MLflow. They look like great options. The size of the team and where we are, it, we just didn't have enough time to investigate these fully before rolling this process out. So we were lazy. We just used GitLab. Um, so GitLab provides a runner which can watch a repository. Uh, and yeah, you can you get a nice UI of how your job's doing. Uh, but what actually happens uh, is GitLab runner will watch a repository, poll a repository for any changes, as soon as there are any changes, spin up your jobs, um, in this case our training jobs, and then uh, we then persist that the, the models out to a bucket. Again, we're using very similar technique. You only get access to the read-only replica through VPC. So, yeah. VPC peering, um, so ensuring that we're keeping that surface area of our data as small as possible. Um, we found this has worked for us for now. Um, is this a long-term solution? Probably not, but that's probably a problem for Q1 next year. Um, but we do have uh, Prometheus metrics uh, from the runner. Uh, we're reusing existing uh, infrastructure and tooling and we're doing a reasonable job now. The only limitation I would currently say, you have specific hardware requirements for your training. Um, you're gonna have to set up a, a runner almost per project because configuration of the, uh, the jobs uh, is done by the runner and you can't, we couldn't check something to the repository to say you need to run on this kind of node. So it's, it is limited, but it works for us in for the simple use case we're at at the moment. So, how do we expose our models uh, to business logic? It's the next question. Um, as I mentioned, we don't want to be writing our services. The team knows uh, Golang, and we're building out that. Do we want? Are we at a stage where we could go build our own uh, model-serving framework? I know a few people have tried it before, maybe off the back of Kafka. It's worked reasonably well, <laughs> um, but it's not perfect, and there's a lot of maintenance overhead. Um, so yeah. Uh, so. Seldom saves a day. Um, again, one, one command install if you're running Helm. Super easy to set up. And what this gives us is um, the ability to configure an inference graph. So here uh, is a, another diagram I've stolen from Seldon. Um, we have defined here an inference graph that runs inside a pod within Kubernetes world. So uh, API provided over REST and gRPC feature transformation and then using a uh, multi-arm bandit uh, gifted to us from the Selden community. We've used Thompson sampling, uh, for example, to choose the best model based on the data that's come in. So how does this look when you actually would write your specification for this in your Kubernetes world? And I apologize, this is one of two YAML slides in the talk. I've tried to keep that to a minimum. Uh, so, uh, when you install Seldon via Helm, you get a custom resource called a Seldon deployment. You can then define, uh, essentially, your pod specification uh, using vanilla Kubernetes uh, requirements. So here we'd have node affinity if you need to run a specific type of hardware, pod affinity if you need to be near another node, potentially API requests, data, keeping latency to a minimum. And then your graph is defined uh, down here. So this is a one node graph at the moment that runs a REST classifier. Um, so that's all well and good. We've got uh, a way of deploying these inference graphs. What do these actually look like if we wanted to go build a new service for, say, an example, Python, and get it deployed? 
say, that's it. All you need to do, essentially, is have a way of loading the model and providing a predict function. Nothing else required. Build your Docker image and push that up. So we, uh, we've used this, um, and I'll go on to this later, but it's very, very simple. No effort if you've got your model sat somewhere. Um, and they support uh, uh, out the box um, ability to integrate with TensorFlow, Spark, SKLearn, R, everything you want. But we don't just want to uh, serve predictions within this world. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> 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 I don't know what happened there. Uh, try and find where I was. Sorry about this. Cool. Um, you also have a whole bunch of other functions that you can define uh, and run these as part of your inference graph. So transforming input, transforming output. So for example, we're, uh, we're running classifications over um, a column. We might want to vectorize this as it comes in, have that as a step in our inference graph. You can do routing. Um, uh, so you potentially might have a choice about where you could send, uh, call the next step in your inference graph. Again, do this in your root function. The, uh, this is the only function itself that needs to know about how you've deployed your service. So the root function, you just return a, an index of the next service, you'd, the, the next child service you'd like to root to. And we also have a function where we can define some Prometheus metrics. So you can you know, push out metrics for your service um, just as you would in any other world. You just need to define a di dictionary uh, of the metric name and the type of metric it is. Uh, one thing, oh, yeah. So what does the API look like? We're doing a co-request with inside the cluster. Uh, we're just calling predict on our service. And we pass in uh, ND array. And then we get our prediction back out. Uh, if in a slightly more complicated example uh, that we're probably a little way away from doing is you can then pass a reward function back, uh, a reward um, assessment back. So given your input and your output, you can call a reward endpoint and say, right, this was either a good, uh, good prediction, bad prediction, or, even, or additional detail that you want. So what does this mean for your uh, technical team? So, Engineering, data science, and DevOps uh, typically would work with the deployment controller. So this could be your kubectl on your machine, uh, Helm, or in our case, uh, doing everything via GitLab and then talking to kubectl and Helm. So any updates to uh, perhaps uh, your, your the, the seldom deployment definition, we push the Kubernetes API that'd be updated, and then the seldom operator would deal with uh, spinning up the uh, deployment graph for you. Um, super simple, super easy. Your engineering teams can work on the services, push those out, you update the model images, you're gonna get a new deployment. Your data scientists potentially working on models, uh, you push that model uh, out, you, as long as um, you trigger a new deployment, we're gonna, you're gonna end up spinning the service and make it available to others, and finally DevOps can do whatever it is DevOps do, tinker with things, get the metrics working. They make any changes around that point and you get your new deployment graph. So we now got machine learning into our cloud native environment. All we need to do from the business logic side, as we saw with that example, is call the service. Um, <laughs> Seldon would bootstrap um, here with the images of a service orchestrator. So this manages the routing uh, around the inside of the service and, and the the messaging within there, but it's all running inside a single pod within your Kubernetes environment. And for the sake of keeping all these sections the same, here's what this looks like for us. Um, we have a Seldon operator managing the graphs, and then we've got a number of services that will be calling functions on these graphs. So, to summarize, uh, we've got language bindings in Python, R, Java, Node, and uh, Go alpha bindings. Um, this is perfect for us. Um, hopefully you should see us through for a long time. Uh, we're able to define uh, nodes in our inference graph for predicting, transforming, routing, compiling, and aggregating as required. Uh, and we provided metrics via Prometheus. Cool. So, 
gone through our stack, as it were, of things we'd like to try out. But how do we put this all together? So we chose a fairly simple use case for us in terms of getting uh, cloud native machine learning into production and handling it that way. So one part of the functionality of our tool is when you upload a data set or we pull, pull a data set down for you, uh, first time we see it, we have to label it. So here, for example, if you wanted to do uh, ethnicity analysis, the ethnicity column has to be labeled with ethnicity. So as I mentioned before, we've been collecting about two years worth of data. We've had customer, customers labeling their data for about two years. This might actually be a really good problem for us to go predict the labels that might be worthwhile putting against uh, this data set. So did the investigation phase using um, JupyterHub, looked at some techniques, found one which we thought would work, um, and then went about building out a uh, repository for this. So within this repository, we contain both the service definitions and the model training code. Uh, service definition is um, literally one of those Python services that you saw, uh, and a Docker image to build around that. Any changes to that are service is tested, we'll dockerize it, we'll persist the Docker image, and then we'll update the deployment repo, which will trigger a deploy. Uh, if you update any of the model code or any references to data that uh, you need for training, testing, etc., cetera, um, we'll trigger a train and then persist the model data. We're not at the stage yet where we can automatically update a model uh, in, in our environments. We're still a little, we're a little bit immature in that point. So we've got about 20 system labels and we just want to verify the accuracy of all those before we actually pull the trigger and say, yes, this is better. We could look at A-B testing this um, around uh, either using a router ourselves or A-B testing is on the roadmap for cells at the moment, but not currently provided. So we're just a little bit immature as it were. However, this is a, Super simple uh, inference graph for us. We've got a REST API, vectorize our columns, and then we predict a label. So our deployment, super simple. We've got two, uh, two containers defined, and then our uh, graph is defined as the transformer followed by the label prediction. Simple as that. So Um, so that's great, we've got a uh, machine learning service in production, how do we get this in front of our users? So one option for us was just to go blindly replace this for everyone, uh, but we thought we'd take a bit more of a slow approach. So as I, as I mentioned, we are using the Unleash experimentation framework. So for any new users that signed up for a period of time, we enrolled them in, uh, inside a feature flag. So for us, it's simply a case of adding their company ID uh, to an experiment. They then, rather than uh, using our traditional system of labeling, which would look up how you've historically labeled things, you'll use our prediction service instead. So uh, we've got reasonably good output at the moment. Uh, so on the, on the very left, we had our initial version. On the middle, we've managed to label pretty much everything with system labels. And then uh, another example on the right. So We've only had about seven or eight companies using this so far, but the primary thing we've seen is people are spending less time on this mapping screen when they first use the tool. So people are getting real benefit from this, and we've got the numbers within um, our analytics to back this up. So was this worthwhile? Um, yeah, this, okay, it might be a very small trivial example. We're not, you know, we're not doing deep learning yet. Big scary world there. but. It works for us. We're doing our end-to-end -end machine learning inside our Kubernetes cluster. And it great, it just works. Infrastructure setup is super simple. If you're already running Helm, there's three commands for us to run and you're good to go. Yes, there's little bits of configuration around OAuth and a few other things, but if you just want to try it out, just run those commands and it works great. Um, is GitLab the uh, long-term solution for model training? Uh, probably not. When are we gonna replace it? Probably Q1 next year, but it's working now. We've got our bespoke jobs, they're running. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep going as we, are, as we were. Um, 
as I mentioned, currently only got simple Selden deployments. So uh, that graph you saw there is very, very simple, two steps. How does this behave under more complex uh, scenarios? Um, it's not something we've had the opportunity to try just yet, but something we're looking to do. And who, yeah, we can't, we can't say yet how this is going to affect potentially a production cluster, for example. Um, the early feedback around the UI UX, particularly not having to label, um, has been invaluable. So the way we've um, approached this is, OK, we've done our investigation. Let's actually stub out the, um, the model serving service at the same time with building out the, the training data. So we can deploy something that looks, looks like what, what you might get back um, using, real, uh, using the real infrastructure. The experiment, experiment can be built out at the same time. And as soon as we're ready, we can start enabling that for users. One word of caution, though. Uh, the landscape is constantly evolving. Uh, Selden is pre-1.0. Uh, uh, it may die uh, next year. Who knows? Um, the approach we've taken is we're, we're wrapping our models in Selden. And they're very, very simple wrappers. So at the end of the day, if something better comes along, it's not going to be too much effort for us to migrate over to that. So finally, uh, some recommended reading around getting set up at Jupyter Hub, uh, Selden Core, GitLab pipelines, they're interested. Great article from Martin Fowler on feature toggles. And uh, if you haven't yet read that paper, Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems from NIPS 2015, it's uh, a really great explanation about how much actual infrastructure processes sit around actually your tiny, tiny bit of uh, model code. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Ant. That was a really great talk. I hope you all really enjoyed it too. Uh, we have quite a bit of time now for questions. Um, so. Some of you have heard me say this already, and I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but it's really important, so I need to say it again. Um, this is a Q&A session, so we're looking for questions. Um, if you have opinion or you wish to um, debate something, come and talk to Ant at the end. Um, but right now, uh, we'd love to hear your questions. And if I feel that maybe there's no inflection at the end of what you're saying, or I can't hear your question mark, <laughs> I will ask you to stop. So, be warned. Right. Um, but we really do want to hear your questions, so please don't let me put you off. Um, do we have any questions? Fantastic. So our lovely Lizzie here has the mic. She's going to bring it to you. Um, hang on to the mic until Ant's finished answering, because we found a few times that poor Lizzie's having to run back and forth to give it back to people. So hang on to it. Over to you. Uh, thanks for interesting talk. Uh, I have one question. H have you considered uh, using uh, TensorFlow Extended? Uh, we haven't looked at that, to be honest. So we're, we're not doing anything around TensorFlow at this stage. So a lot of the work we're doing with Harvard is all more traditional based machine learning. It needs to be explainable. If we're making predictions around pay and how you should potentially change that, or if there's um, uh, any discrepancies there, it needs to be explainable to our users. We're, we're working on that explainability piece, but the UI UX just isn't there yet. So it's primarily HR and reward managers uh, using our tool. We need to be able to explain it in a way that they can understand and they, they don't all have a statistics background, as it were. Yeah, it, it, can, it can work with any model you have. It so doesn't require like deep learning. I, I've, I've not, not used it. Cool. So Lizzie, there's a... Um yeah, chap in the in the navy. Navy? Is it navy or black? I can't see from here. Dark, dark colored jacket. Hi, uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, I like that you've taken steps to manage how data is used in investigation environments. Um, are you currently doing any anonymization of how th that data gets to people, or maybe <laughs> providing differential data sets? to your um, data scientists, or do you plan yeah. to do that? Do you see that as an important thing, potentially? Uh, so that is a hugely important thing. Uh, so as I mentioned, currently very small um, company. So two of us working on this. Uh, we are both on the operations team, so we see all the customer data anyway. Absolutely in the future, uh, anonymization steps. So particularly given we understand the kinds of data customers are uploading, it's 
very easy for us to say, oh, this is actually all employee ID. Let's not give you that, and we'll, or we'll hash it or encrypt it. So yeah, only certain people get that. Uh, we, we've talked about having a pipeline. So rather than when you make your request for data, you would actually go through and would generate a spin up a job to generate and to anonymize a section of it and then store it again in a read-only replica. Okay, great, thank you. More questions, we have time. Don't be shy. Oh yeah, okay, gentleman in the check shirt. Lizzie's on her way. <coughs> Hi, I just wondered uh, when companies upload their data yep. to the system now, and you mentioned GDPR at one yep. point, where you s um, you've had to came across any sort of difficulties with uh, saying that your data will be used to train models uh, that may potentially benefit other companies. Or is that uh, so we, it's in our terms that we can use your data for these uh, these processes. Um, no one's no one's um, said no to that yet, um, which is good for us. We uh, currently uh, we're a data processor as well within the GDPR framework. So um, no, we've not had any issues yet, and no one's thrown up their hand. The only so the only thing we do do is uh, upon deletion requests. We'll obviously go delete that from the database and any trace of that. When we're uh, building our model <coughs> uh, model training pipelines, we just the input is um, references to data, so all our data in our tools versioned. So you get a, re a versioned reference. So if that doesn't exist when we want to go train the same model later, um, unfortunately, it's gone at that point. Um, well just one more question, right. if I might. Um, could you give us some examples of like? For machine learning, uh, what sort of your input um, data is and what your sort of classifications are? Uh, yep, so, uh, so for this example, uh, so for these, um, we very, very just did this off the headers that people have been using. So these values on the left say so employee number, job title, pay, uh, full time equivalent, salary for personal bonus, FTE one, hours per week, continuous start date. Um, so we just built a very, a very simple model to prove out this use case that we can take a, essentially a list of column headers, um, we'll vectorize that, and then we'll predict an output as one of um, one of these labels. We've got about 20 in-house system ones, so uh, gender, business unit, job level, tenure, age, um, so they will come, out, come back out as a number, and then we map that back to the label that it should be. But yeah, happy to show some more examples afterwards. Okay, more questions. Anybody else? I'm just, just going to give it a minute because yeah. sometimes people need a little bit of time to feel brave because I know c asking a question can be a bit, a bit weird sometimes. All right. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, see, it worked. Hey, hey. Uh, Lizzie's on her way to you. Thank you for backing me up there and not making me look <laughs> too silly. <laughs> Um, I'm not technical, so I hope yep. the question isn't stupid. Um, I was curious, early on in your presentation, that you said there's the Airbnbs and Ubers with yep. these vast teams and infrastructures, and there's the Googles and Amazons with their coupled provisions. Yep. Is there any open source collaborative movement going on that you're aware of that uh, may be worth knowing about? Absolutely. So, Seldom, one of them, open source projects, uh, reasonably big community, uh, and integrates with a whole bunch of others, other open source projects. Kubeflow, MLflow tackle parts of these problems as well. So there, there's a huge, the landscape is shifting and everybody's building different parts to solve this kind of end-to-end -end machine learning problem. Some of them integrate well with others, others don't. Um, yeah, I, what the thing we need to do is just keep an eye on where it's going. If this project look like starts to look like it's dying, we'll jump ship somewhere else. And hopefully, hopefully that shouldn't be too much effort Okay, any more for any more? Oh, there we go, in the middle there. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, you've mentioned a few times about um, GitLab being the current solution, but Q1 is when you do something yep. else. Have you thought about what that next step is? Uh, yeah, so we wanna, so during our kind of early look into this phase, we looked at Kubeflow and MLflow. Want to take uh, those out for a proper spin and kick the tires and 
see if they are fit for purpose based on the work we're currently doing and the research that we've got coming out of Harvard. Is, is this going to be something for us going forward? Um, it's very much an investigation. I'm, I'm of the opinion that if we want to go see if something works, let's go build it and see if it works. Um, very much a try and build it. If it fails, it fails. Then we'll move on to something else. Thank you so much. OK, I don't see any more hands. That was a, oh, yes. OK, this will be our last question. And then we'll break for refreshments. Hi. Uh, yeah, great talk. Thank you. Uh, sorry, it's not really a technical question, yeah. but I wondered how uh, you find that businesses take it when you tell them that they are discriminating against <laughs> groups within their, <laughs> of their employees. Um, so we're lucky uh, at the moment, uh, as I said, statistics-based tool. We, often do, we also do um, a bit of consultancy in-house around that. So we help people with their messaging and how, how they can actually close these gaps and do a better job. The big question at the moment is, right, if once we uh, get this piece around explaining resilience, explaining pay gaps in front of users, how do you tell people to do that? And then what, what do you tell them to do about it? There's so many different factors. Luckily, we've got a client that's working with us on this, so they're, they're very much a friendly force, going, talking, uh, working with us around the UI, UX, messaging, and um, it's even things like we're sending surveys out to their employees and we're getting data back from there. So it really helps having that kind of industry advocate and they're super bought into the mission and without our users, we've got people who do it for um, legislative purposes and that they'll upload their data once a year and go, right, box checked, send it to the government, we'll wait till next year. And we've got companies that are really bought into the agenda, so they'll be uploading every month. They'll be either talking to us internally about how, what do these numbers mean, how do we improve this? Um, so yeah, it's, we haven't got to the point where we said, actually, you're a really bad company. <laughs> um, we hope to get there, but we hope to get to the point where we can say, actually, you're really bad in this area. Here's how you might want to improve it. It's either by hiring more people within this role, promoting these people, et cetera. Um, but it comes back to that explainable machine learning. We can't just say, do this, and then that's it. Awesome, last question. All right, so let's give our lovely Anne uh, a final round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, we need to do an Icelandic thunderclap as well. Uh, oh, there was a bit of a groan there. I wondered, I wondered when you'd all get a bit fed up with this. But anyway, we're almost at the end. So does everyone know what I'm talking about now? It's the one clap. Yes, okay. So three, two, one. Thunderclap. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to break now.